Welcome back to The Breakfast here on PLOS TV Africa. It's time for Today in History. and We're going back to uh, telling you things that happened on this day many, many years ago. I'm going back to the year 2019. And actually, it's a follow-up to the story that we shared yesterday, the start mm -hmm. of the Rwandan genocide after the president and, of course, uh, President of Burundi back then were both uh, uh, killed, rather, in, um, in, after their plane was shot down. The Rwandan genocide on this day in 2019 um, marked its uh, remembrance, or rather the country marked the remembrance of 25 years after the U Rwandan, Rwandan genocide. Um, we shared yesterday that that led to the loss of between 200 and 800,000 lives in a 100 days massacre. It occurred between the 7th of April and 15th of July 1994 during the civil war. And of course, um, uh, most estimates, of course, I already said that it, all, almost 800,000 people lost their lives. The scale and brutality of the massacre caused worldwide shock, even if no country actually stepped in to save those lives, but they were shocked. Most of the victims were killed in their own villages or towns, and many of the neighbors, uh, or by many of their neighbors and fellow villagers. Sexual violence was also rife, and I shared just yesterday that up to 250 to 500,000 women were raped in this 100 day period. On the 7th of April, as the genocide started, RPF Commander Paul Kagame warned the Crisis Committee and UNAMIR that he would resume the civil war if the killing did not stop. Um, Rwanda's president um, said the country had become a family once again while marking the 25th anniversary of the genocide that killed 800,000 people. And that was in 2019. Most of those who died were minority Tutsis and moderate Hutus killed by ethnic Hutu extremists. Um, so I'm sharing this, you know, and it's a great thing to share this. And I said that it's something I feel like Nigeria needs to learn from. And that is the fact that 25 years later, they, as a country, of course, in the, in the period that they've decided that they want to develop, Rwanda has, you know, gotten a lot of kudos for the steps that Paul Kagame has taken with regards to developing the nation and, and you know, building, um, moving forward after the genocide. Um, the genocide really should, should is an, it's, it's an event that should have shut down that whole country and completely wrecked the, you know, the nation. But in, in time that has passed, they've been able to find their footing again. Mm -hmm. They've been able to, I think they, they also have the highest number of women in governance, women in politics um, in the world. Um, but also the fact that they have been able to find a way to reconcile um, ethnicity and tribalism and all those things might, might never be completely uh, taken out of Africa because that's, that's who we truly are. But they found a way to reconcile. They found a way to also bring back those memories of, you know, memories of the 1994 genocide and have those conversations, try and heal those wounds. Mm -hmm. That might be entirely impossible. But, you know, in the spirit of reconciliation and in the spirit of finding the way forward after all the disaster and all the death that have, has happened in Rwanda, um, that's why they took those steps. I believe, I think one of, uh, I think the vice president also attended one of those um, uh, memorial services or um, um, remembrance for the Rwandan genocide. And so what, you know, I've felt like Nigeria needs to learn from is being able to have open conversations about the Nigerian civil war, about the Biafran war, and stop acting like it is a taboo to speak about it. And even stop the current like, crisis. Yes, you know, and, and, you know, yes, learning from what happened in Rwanda to save us from the, the likelihood of that ever occurring in Nigeria. And also being able to recognize the fact that Th up to 3 million people died during the Nigerian Civil War. Mm -hmm. Igbos, Southeasterners, you know, died in that war um, through starvation and, through, of course, through military bombardment from the Nigerian army. Um, we fail to recognize that. We fail to accept that. You know, you know yes, it might be called war, but, you know, there was wrong that was done to the Southeasterners. And we've continued to ignore and push away those conversations that may have healed and, you know, True. maybe have soothed some of, uh, soothed some of the pain that, you know, currently is, you know, the Southeast is dealing with. Um, we should have a Biafran remembrance. We should have a Biafran Civil War, Nigerian Civil War Remembrance Day um, in Nigeria. At least to honor the memory to honor, of, absolutely. you know, those people. And there are lots of people whose families were affected by this. The stories of the Civil War has been passed down, you know, to them. And you see just how much anger they have, you know, when they talk about politics in Nigeria. And they recall how their, you know, parents or great-grandparents were killed, how, you know, they suffered, you know, disabilities, 
because of that war. So really, we need to have open conversations about that. I mean, look at the Rwandan example. The African Union ha you know, has been making comments about this in the country. They're also going to hold a remembrance this year. But uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic restrictions, it's not going to be like a, a big ceremony like, like usual. Yes. But really, like you said, we need to actually be honest with ourselves and be open about these things. Right. And, and it, sh it should be on both sides. You know, let, let's not you know, also make it seem like, oh, it's just Southeasterners that died. You know, they died in more numbers, but on both mm -hmm. sides, regardless of how it wants to be spoken about, it should be spoken about. We, shouldn't, we should stop shying away and pushing away those conversations like they are forbidden. Let's talk about it. Let's have those conversations. Let's reunite Nigeria, and not just with words, but with actions also. Yes. Let's now tell you the second thing that happened today in history. It was in China. And in the year 2020, just last year, the 7th of April, China ended its lockdown of Wuhan, the city at the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic, after 76 days of shutdown and after the country reported no new deaths for the first time. Well, China had sealed off the Chinese city of Wuhan where the coronavirus had begun. And residents were not allowed to leave the country. But after, you know, no new death was recorded, authorities allowed residents to leave the city for the first time. You know, 11 million people had been put under lockdown to contain the spread of coronavirus. And uh, when the city eventually opened, officials, you know, put in efforts to make sure it was indeed an event. You know, they, they put on a show, a light show, activity picked up on the streets of Wuhan, even though many businesses, you know, remained shut. And uh, President Xi Jinping declared it as an early victory over the COVID-19 crisis, even when Western countries were still struggling to contain the outbreak of the virus. And uh, we see now that uh, vaccinations in the country, you know, really, really picked up uh, speaking to my friends in China, he said most most people, majority of the people in China have been vaccinated against coronavirus. And yes, that's what happened today in history. 76 days after Wuhan was locked down, total lockdown, the city was reopened today on April 7th. So, so they, they took the, you know, I, I, from what I heard, you know, they took some of the most stringent and tough steps against uh, coronavirus. Yes. They um, didn't play with it. Um, maybe also lucky for them, they don't have, you know, the freedom for people to be anti-maskers and uh, people to say, oh, you know, it's my right to decide whether where I want to wear a mask yes. or not, like in the United States. Um, they maybe also understood the, you know, the, how serious, you know, it was, uh, the, the, uh, the virus that they were dealing with. Mm -hmm. And so they took their steps and they had less people die in China than they had in, in the United States and many other countries across the world. Um, so, yeah, yeah, we should probably... And, and in China, one really nice thing I, I, I saw that they do is when you're vaccinated, they have a buy one, get one free ice cream deal. So when you're <laughs> vaccinated, you can go and buy an ice cream and you get one free. So imagine Nigeria does that, you know, you get vaccinated and you get food free. You get, you know, your favorite pizza free. They probably you know will. To get they probably will, um, you know, have that kind of arrangement. You just thought people would hold them in warehouses and they would never release them. <laughs> you know, so un unfortunately, that's that's our situation. But anyway, that's wicked. <laughs> <laughs> that's today in history, 2019 and 2020. One of them from Rwanda, and of course, uh, marking the 25-year remembrance of uh, the um, Rwandan genocide. And of course, in China, the lockdown in Wuhan was lifted on this day in 2020. Uh, stay with us. So we're going into our first major conversation for today. Earlier, we spoke about the strikes going on across the country. National, National Association of Resident Doctors, the, uh, of course, uh, ASU, threatening they might be going back on strike. Academic Staff Union of Polytechnics is also in the conversation. And, of course, Jusun. And that's what we're coming up with right after the short break.